Hello, welcome to www.everydayhdr.com. My name is Blake Rudis, and uh, today I'm going to talk about my post processing in Adobe Camera Raw with a Photomatix tone mapped image. And you can do this with any tone mapped image for that matter, it doesn't have to necessarily be Photomatix, but that's what I'm using for this one. I've gone over many things in the past couple weeks as far as my 32 bit processing and uh, so on and so forth, especially with Adobe Camera Raw. But one of the things that a lot of people forget about is that Adobe Camera Raw is not just designed for raw image files. It's also designed for uh, TIFFs and JPEGs as well. And it's very powerful and you can use it to your advantage. So with this, basically anything that I do in Photomatix or any tone mapping software for that matter is to try and just get a baseline image. What I'm trying to do is, is get a working HDR canvas. And that canvas, I don't want to be too dark I don't want it to be too light, and I don't want it to be too stylized. I do all that later in post-processing. What I'm trying to get out of the tone mapping software is the detail and the best of both worlds. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times uh, you open up these shadow areas in tone mapping, and you start to see stuff that you really do like in those shadow areas. And, but it doesn't stop there. You have to do something in post-processing. So what I strive for in all of my tone, tone mapping endeavors is to get this look in my HDR images. I will, I'll go and show you the preview first. So that's a single single exposure and here is the tone map file. What I do like about the original exposure is the shadows, is these strong shadows here, uh, the shadows in, in, the, in the, uh, the stream that's going by. But what I like about the tone mapped image is the detail. It, it makes me feel like I was there and that's why I HDR. That's 100%. That's why I started this stuff to begin with. So the settings that I use to get this baseline image uh, are what I call from Castaway 2012. The reason why is because I went to this place called Castaway Point, Nebraska, and I just happened to make the preset Castaway. And it turns out that it ends up being a good starting point for almost all of my HDR images. I say almost all of them because it's not perfect for every one of them. So don't think that you can take this and use this as the 100% foolproof way that Blake Rudis said I could use uh, Photomatix for. That's not what it's for. It's designed to just get you a baseline image. Strength set to 100. Your color saturation about 55. You don't want to get too saturated with color in Photomatix. And the reason why is that we'll do that later in post-processing. Luminosity set to 10.0. Detail contrast around negative one. And you can play with that. You know, move it up, move it down, see what you like. Uh, that's too dark to me. So that's why I, I, like I said before, you don't want it too dark, you don't want it too light, and you don't want it too stylized. Lighting adjustments, almost 99% of the time I'm in medium. I don't like surreal. I don't like surreal plus at all. Medium is good. Natural plus almost doesn't look like it's doing too much to the image in a positive way. So I like, me I like medium. You want to put your smooth highlights at about 29, your white point at 2.428%. And that is that is like a, I don't know, it doesn't have to be exactly that. You can do 2.5 or 2.3 if you want. Black point about 0.12, gamma 1.3, temperature 1.9. That might be based off your image too. So take that one kind of with a grain, grain of salt there. You can, you can manipulate that however you want uh, for, for the most part. Micro smoothing always down to zero because that's going to give you your detail. I mean, you can you can move that up if you'd like, but you're going to lose all that awesome detail that we have in this image. At least I like, I call it awesome. That's just my style. Saturation in the highlights, negative 5.2. Saturation in the shadows, negative 4.3. Smoothness of 50 and shadows clipping of zero. And like I said, this is just a baseline. This is just gets me started. So I'm going to go ahead and press process on that. And after this process is I'm going to save it as a TIFF file, a 16-bit TIFF. And how you do that is go to File, click on the image. Uh, sometimes Photomax takes a little bit of time on my computer for some reason. Okay, File, Save As, 16-bit TIFF. You can select 8-bit uh, TIFF, 16-bit TIFF, or JPEG. I prefer the 16-bit TIFF because it's going to give me the most out of um, out of all of the raw files that were used to make this file. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my desktop, uh, my folder is going to be experiments. I'll put this in my experiments folder and press save. Okay, so now we can go ahead and exit out of Photomatix and go into our um, desktop experiments and go right here, navigate right to that. Now, 
here's one thing I didn't cover. This is a TIFF file, and it opened directly in, in, in Photoshop. And you can do that by setting your uh, Adobe Camera Raw settings to do so. So I, would, I just exited out of there for you real quick. I'm going to go to Edit, go to Preferences, Camera Raw. In Camera Raw, where it says TIFF, Automo automatically open all supported TIFFs. You can also set it to automatically open all supported JPEGs, whether they have settings or all JPEGs open. Um, I don't really work too much with JPEGs. I pretty much work in 16-bit TIFFs and save everything as a JPEG that goes on the internet for web or for printing uh, or for sending to my family. That's about the. I don't do any editing on JPEGs though. A JPEG to me is the end of it, so I don't really want to open those in camera raw. So uh, automatically open all supported TIFFs. That's the highlight here. Press OK. Now we're going to go back to that folder and open that up. So this is going to open up an Adobe Camera Raw now because we told it anything that's a TIFF file that you can support, open on up. And anything from Photomatix that's a TIFF file, it can support. So we're good to go. So the first thing I always want to do is look at the white balance in my photo. So I'm going to go to the white balance here and go between Auto and As Shot and see what I like. I like As Shot better because the Auto uh, is almost too blue for me. But... Um, I don't like how blue it is, and I don't how like how lacking this is in some in some warmth. So I'm going to move the temperature up to the right just a little bit, just to add a little bit of autumn warmth to this photo. So the next thing I want to do is address all my boring stuff first. I mean, there's stuff like you know fixing straight lines and this, that, and the other. That's what I get out of the way first. That way I don't forget. Fix the white balance, and then I go to straighten the photo. I'm going to find a a vertical on this photo that's a, that's a strong vertical and that vertical to me is going to be right here in the back that's our focal point so I'm going to go up to the straighten tool or you can press A to get the straighten tool click my left click and drag to get that straight tool and then what you can't see here is um, the preview right now it's previewing when you zoomed in that far you can't see that, that it's doing a preview but you can see all these little uh, edges here when I press enter it's going to commit to those changes so now that line is now a straight line and I'll go with that I'm good with that the next thing I want to do is fix all these nasty chromatic aberrations I can see them from here if you're watching this in HD you can probably see them as well those chromatic aberrations are living right up in here they're these uh, purple nasty hue uh, the uh, fringes that end up on the edges of my leaves so to fix that, I'm going to go into the Lens Correction Module. It's the sixth one in from the left. I'm going to click Move Chromatic Aberrations. Sometimes all you have to do is click that, and it works. Other times, you have to go down here and look at the color that is affecting your image. For this one, it's purple, so I'm going to move that purple over. You can also adjust the hue of that purple. If that's not quite fixing it, you can move the hue slider back and forth to see what hue you want end up being when, once all it's said and done and right here that looks pretty good actually an increase on that hue and there's there's no green chromatic aberrations in this one so I don't need to worry about it so right click fit and view again next thing I want to do is uh, noise reduction so I'm going to go into an area that has noise in it basically the shadow area that's where a lot of that noise lives and I'm going to look at my luminance value and I usually set this anywhere between 40 and 50 and then the luminance detail a little bit below that and the reason why I go below the, the 40 to 50 is that if you put the luminance detail higher, it starts to kind of artifact in those areas. And, and your luminance, uh, your noise reduction really isn't doing much of anything when it's got that much luminance detail that high. Um, so we'll stick uh, to about a 50 under the luminance noise reduction and luminance detail about 48, 47, 48. So at any time you can press P to preview what's going on here. Um, luminance contrast, you can adjust that as well. A lot of times it doesn't do much of anything. I don't really see it doing much of anything. So, if you hold Alt, you can see what these are doing in black and white on your image. Uh, so if that helps you see uh, with the lack of color, uh, that's, that's one way you can do it. Press Alt or Option on a Mac. Okay, so let's uh, what we cover here. We covered the the basic boring stuff. We went over um, lens correction to fix the chromatic aberrations. We fixed the non straight line in the back of the photo, and as you can see, the bridge is kind of wonky, but that gazebo back there is actually pretty straight. And we fixed the white balance. 
So now we can get into the fun stuff. In the fun stuff, we can start adjusting the curves, contrast, uh, or exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, blacks. This is where a lot of the good stuff is going to come from. The stuff that really makes an image pop off the page. So I'm just, I, what I do is I just get into it. I actually move all the way to the left, move all the way to the right, and see what fits and what works. My eye will kind of stop me on an area as I move this back and forth, and I say, okay, bam, that works for me right there. Same thing with contrast. I increase it, I decrease it, and then I find I find a little spot that I can just kind of call home as I as I move these tight back and forth back and forth and then I find an area that I like one thing to do uh, you can press the U and the O key and that will give you a highlight blowout or shadows clipping warning the red is a highlight clipping warning the blue is a uh, shadows clipping warning or what I also like to do is press and hold alt with any of the settings uh, highlights shadows whites or blacks or option on a Mac and when you press and hold alt it shows you the areas that are clipping right now in your shadows anything that's black is not being affected anything that's white or uh, a, a, a different color are the channels that that blowout is affecting and the same thing with the shadows as you increase those you'll start to see that those black areas are where it's starting to clip you can press U and O at any time to get rid of those. If you don't want to use U and O, you can use the Alt or Option key. So the idea behind the tone mapping was to get something that's not too light or not too dark or not too stylized so that we could do the, 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 the stylizing later in post-processing. And that's what we're doing now. At any time, you can press P to preview the, the changes that you're working on right now. And this is starting to get a little dark on I me. Mean, I'm going to increase the exposure just a little bit. So now we're going to go to clarity. And I don't like what happens with clarity when it's all the way up. This is an HDR image. It's already been tone mapped. The clarity slider is kind of like a detail adjustment. It's kind of like tone mapping, essentially. So if you get too much into clarity on an already tone mapped image, it starts to look like crap. So I like to keep that pretty, pretty minimal. Vibrance. Vibrance is an awesome adjustment. Vibrance is kind of like saturation but it increases the color where the color is needed. So it looks at, at all the color in the image and says, okay, these colors that are oversaturated, I'm not going to affect. The colors that aren't saturated enough, I'm going to add a little bit more saturation to. So I like using the vibrance slot, uh, adjustment. I do not like using the saturation adjustment because it's too global. It's too much. It just it takes the saturation of everything and just says, okay, blah, let's just throw up everywhere with all these colors and nastiness. So at any time you can press P to preview what you've done. So we've done a lot of work here. We've taken a tone mapped HDR image to get that detail and that, that what I like to call awesomeness out of the HDR image and really start to bring those areas back in that belong there to begin with, like I said before, those shadow areas that we lost during tone mapping. So at this point, you can open the image uh, or press shift and open image as an object, which is sometimes a good idea to do. That way you don't end up um, doing any damage to that raw image data and if you ever need to go back to it you can just double click on it and open it up in camera raw and go right back to camera raw after doing some of your edits so now that we're in, in camera raw uh, or sorry in photoshop i want to do dodging and burning and i want to cover dodging and burning real quick because it's extremely important first thing you want to do is make a new layer press the new layer button and then press shift f5 and then fill that 50 percent gray press ok now go to uh, overlay or soft light. Um, I prefer overlay. And then click on your dodge tool. And that's a that's a good size dodge tool. This is the important part up here. We want a brush size of about 300, a range to be in the mint tones, and our exposure to be anywhere from 15 to 25. And we do want to protect the tones. If you're working with the pen tablet, which I am, you're going to want to make sure that, that print the pen pressure is there. Now, we're set up for dodging and burning right now. For dodging right now, we're set up. So I can dodge any areas out that I want to right now on this layer. And it's going to make those areas light. It's going to bring in those areas that I want to be to be lighter. So, you know, I, now I just kind of go in through here and use a, a painterly kind of idea. And look at things that are already kind of light that I want to bring forward a little bit more. And just kind of accent those with, with dodging and burning. And then if I press and hold Alt or Option on a Mac, it puts me in the dodged in the burn tool. Pardon me. So now I can burn and dodge right out, 
right as I'm as I'm working with one tool I can work with the other one by pressing and holding alt while you paint I'm now in the dodge tool if I release alt I'm in I'm in the sorry I'm in the dodge tool now because I have dodge tool selected if I press alt it will give me the burn tool my apologies it gets kind of confusing so right now I'm dodging and if I hold alt or option I can start burning release alt or option and I'm dodging again so you can really start to push and pull all of these uh, uh, details in and out of the image with dodging and burning. I, that's why I love dodging and burning. It's the most important part, I think, to post-processing is that final step to dodge and burn and make sure everything looks good and that you're pushing away your dark areas and pulling forward your highlight areas or vice versa. It just depends on what you, what you want to do at the time. It's all up to you. You are the artist. So let's do a uh, preview of that. No dodging and burning, no dodging and burning, dodging and burning. It just helps to pull everything together. So this started out as a tone mapped HDR image that didn't have much depth to it. And we did that on purpose. We didn't want it to have any depth. It wasn't meant to have any depth. And then we gave it depth. We gave it that purpose. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you the difference now between the two. Let me open up this file and go back to the defaults and open it. Here's our before and here's our after. And this area back here could probably be lightened up a little bit. So I always like to go back and look at things two or three times. Go back to the dodge tool and just open up that gazebo area because it was start we were starting to lose it back there. I think I I burned it when I should have dodged it, you know? I actually have three sticky notes that say dodge and burn above my monitor so that I never forget to dodge and burn at the end of my photo. Alright, again this is www.everydayhdr.com. My name is Blake Rudis and that was my um, tone mapping to Adobe Camera Raw tutorial on post processing. Hope you enjoy this tutorial and I hope it helps you. Uh, one thing I did forget to say, if you want to flatten this out and just go ahead and save it out, press Control Shift Alt or Control Shift E, which will flatten your image. Uh, you can also go to Layer, Flatten, and then File and save this as a JPEG or a TIFF. I always forget to do that. I always forget to tell you how you can do that. But yeah, you can save this as a as a JPEG or a TIFF. Um, and you can, you know, if you want to save it as a TIFF, you can continue processing on it later. You can also save it as a PSD and continue processing on it later. All right, now I'm done. This is EverydayHDR.com. My name is Blake Rudis. Have a great weekend.